kick off now with the first part of it, which is human origins. And we'll start with the fact that the Bible says that in the beginning, in the beginning, you've all heard this was the Word. But in order to explain everything that followed after that, the Word would have to be something on the order of this, if you can see it. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It had to be a heck of a word to cover all that has since, since eventuated. Over time, the creationists changed it. They expanded it a little bit to three words. God did it. God did everything. And that's all you needed for an answer. Why does it rain? God did it. Why does the wind blow? God did it. Everything God did. It. And that worked for a couple thousand years. A couple thousand years, that was all you needed. But then 145 years ago, a new group of people came on the scene, the Darwinists, with what they thought was a better, more rational explanation, which is that nature did it. Don't need God, but nature, and nature only, did it. And there was a line drawn down the middle. God here, nature here, and no mixing. No mixing. 145 years. And then the creationists tried an end run by bringing in a group of much smarter individuals, much better educated than the original ones, and they are called intelligent designers. Intelligent designers. But still, basically, God is at the bottom of their theory as well. God did it. Everything is so complex it couldn't have happened by accident. Therefore, God had to do it. Only recently has a, a much smaller group of individuals started putting forth a theory called intervention. I'm one of those. I'm an interventionist. And what we say is that it wasn't a God with a capital G, an anthropomorphic God. It was a group of gods, multiple people, multiple beings, small g gods. And that they did it. That's our mantra. They did it. Not God did it. Not nature did it. They did it. And that accounts for everything in its own way that has come to be on the earth. And that's what I'm going to be showing you here, basically, tonight. In my beginning, next slide, please. In my beginning, okay, in my beginning, the book, Everything You Know Is Wrong, which is not here. You can't, you can't get it. We tried to ship it here, and it didn't work out with the publisher. A lot of problems. Australia, a long time, etc. You will be able, eventually, if you wanted to get it through Duncan Rhodes, Nexus Magazine. So, if you want, keep in mind. If you want to order it from the States direct, go through Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble has the best shipping rate, www.bn.com. Barnes & Noble. All right, what I've tried to show in the cover here is the interventionist point of view boiled down, that the gods, multiple gods, small g, handed the spark of human life to the primitives that were on the earth at the time, by means of intervention via genetic engineering, which is symbolized by a test tube. That is the theory. We are genetically and genetically engineered species product. And we'll talk about that as time goes by. Next slide. In the beginning, in the beginning, boy, every one of these is apparently going to be cut off at the top, and I'm sorry for that. I don't know how to fix this. But in the beginning, what you have is the cloud. So in, in the Bible's beginning was the Word, and my beginning was the book, and now in the beginning was the cloud of dust and gas swirling around and over about 10 billion years down to about 4.5 billion years ago when the solar system took the shape basically that we know now, and the Earth was basically coalesced out of the cloud as the proto-Earth. Next slide. And at that proto-Earth, 4.5 to 3.5 billion years ago, Proto-Earth was just a seething mass of, of magma being bombarded by asteroids and meteorites. It was just an impossible place to live, as you can see. Next slide. Then as it began to cool off over time from 3.5 to around 2.5, the next billion years, we have cooling enough to where we have incipient land beginning to show, but still it's mostly molten lava, but at least the bombardment of meteorites and all that stuff. Now, there's no one would have thought at one time that life could have begun on Earth at a, at a time like this. So the theory was that life didn't begin until around two billion years ago when it was cooled off enough to have water at least 
and that inorganic molecules were somehow swirled together and became a living thing. Nobody quite understood, but since nature was at the core of everything according to the Darwinists, it had to happen. It just had to happen. They couldn't quite figure it out. It didn't matter. We'll figure it out. They kept assuring everybody, we'll figure it out. And then about 30 years ago, that was what they taught. That's what all you, you were taught. That's what your kids are being taught today. That's what your grandkids are being taught. But about 30 years ago, they found out that, in fact, life had already come to Earth around 4 billion years ago. Next slide. Back when it was seething magma, you saw what it looked like, and everyone pretty much agrees that's what it was. This is what came. Prokaryotic bacteria. Now, if the real if the beginning of life, incipient life, had really started the way they say, it would have been something extremely simple, kind of like a virus. It would have been about the size of one of these little spots in here, like this. Instead, it's this really large, complex, kind of one single cell bacteria called prokaryotic bacteria. Now, you, the one thing that distinguishes it is, though it has a number of DNA strands, it doesn't have a nucleus. The, the DNA is not held within a nucleus, it kind of floats free and loose. That's what distinguishes prokaryotic bacteria. And it came at about four billion years ago, only about a half a billion years from when the Earth was first beginning to coalesce out. So it, it's extremely unlikely that, in fact, impossible that life formed on Earth. It came here whole and complete. Why? Because it didn't come in only one form. There are two types of prokaryotic bacteria. The archaea and the true bacteria. Two types. Distinct different types. So it, it absolutely is for certain that life came here. Now the question really is, how did it get here? Was it directed here? Was it sent here? Was it delivered here on purpose? Or did it just accidentally show up somehow? That is the question that has to be answered now. Now, for the prokaryotic bacteria, the thing you need to keep in mind about it is it is indestructible. Indestructible. That's what's so cool about it. The Earth got what it needed exactly when it needed it. When it was just beginning, if you want to turn a planet into something that can support higher life forms, you've got to give it something that will turn the environment and turn oxygen in, loose in the atmosphere in the water to tie up the free iron, to turn the iron into rust, iron oxide, and then have, have an excess of oxygen so that higher life forms can live on that place. Exactly what the Earth needed, which are these creatures right here to do that, they got. Early on, two forms, all of them indestructible early on. Pretty neat. What an amazing coincidence. An amazing coincidence. Next slide. Okay, and two billion years ago, Remember, we've gone now two billion years, approximately four billion years with the prokaryotes, two billion years with the prokaryotes from four billion years. Just those two kinds, and then suddenly at around two billion years ago, these things appear out of nowhere, just like the prokaryotes did. Out of nowhere come the eukaryotes. You have strata without, and suddenly you have strata with. And they're, they're, here they are. And they're extremely complicated, hundreds to thousands of times larger than the prokaryotes with a nucleus surrounding many, many, many more strands of DNA. This is a sophisticated, yet still, one-celled creature pumping out much more oxygen, much more efficiently. But they couldn't come any sooner because the Earth wasn't prepared. These are fragile. These are not indestructible. These are destructible. So they couldn't come until the Earth had been fixed to a certain extent by the prokaryotes, two billion years prokaryotic activity allowed these to appear. And when they do appear, the Darwinists went with the prokaryotes, they can argue that, well, they came from, you know, maybe from space, from a meteorite or something like that. But the, the eukaryotes have to be explained in practical terms. And what's the only way that could have happened if you don't see any transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes? I mean, uh, from no nucleus to a nucleus, from none of this to all of this, how did it happen? What they say is this, get it, that after a couple of billion years of living side by side, the larger prokaryotes suddenly decide to eat some of the smaller prokaryotes 
And instead of becoming food, the smaller prokaryotes change their physical structure into all these different things, including the nucleus of the eukaryotes. That magically, somehow, they, they cannibalized each other and it worked and a new, much more sophisticated living thing came to be. And for as absurd as it sounds, it's gospel among biologists. It's, it's ridiculous, but it is accepted. Next. Now, this is how this is how they say it happened. These turned into the, all this. It didn't. It's ridiculous. Next slide. After another billion and a half years, from two billion years to around 560 million years ago, just round it off to 500 million give or take. Another billion and a half with the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, tying up the iron, making iron oxide and having an excess of oxygen. Suddenly, out of nowhere, you have the seas filled with creatures. This is called a Cambrian explosion and it's exactly what it was. Thousands of species of animals and plants, none of them looking anything like anything we have on Earth today except the horseshoe crab. That's the only thing that's left, and it looks kind of like this, maybe even the descendant of this one. Other than that, they don't look like anything we have today. And yet it came out of nowhere within about a five million year period, which is an idling compared to all the billions of years that have come preceding that. The Cambrian explosion, boom, <clears throat> there it all is. All 26 animal phyla, animal phyla that we have today came at the same time, again, overnight. No catastrophe, nothing leading into it. It just came when it came and it happened and it was big. Next slide. This is the timeline to show you what I've been telling you. The beginnings at 4.5 and then you have the bombardment and there are the prokaryotes at around 4 billion years ago while the bombardment is still going on. Prokaryotes, prokaryotes, prokaryotes down here to two a uh, billion years ago, and then the eukaryotes joined them. And notice that they're still the same today as they were when they started out. No appreciable, no, no uh, Darwinian evolution at all. It's the same. You would think that the first and the simplest would have had a heck of a lot of evolution to work on, but they don't seem to have. They seem to breed as true today as they did then. Anyway, so the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes continue on, and right here in this little blink right here, that little window, is the five to ten million years when the Cambrian explosion occurred and then after that came the full panoply of complex life as we know it in only the last five point five billion half a billion years five hundred million years so it's a small part of what came before all of, all of complex life as we know it. and how did it happen well next slide what the darwinians tell us is that this is the way it happened it went from eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce, to this guy who can stand here and say, what's it all about? That it was the fish became amphibians, amphibians become reptiles, reptiles become mammals and birds, and mammals become us. Macroevolution, there are two parts to this, two parts. Macroevolution and microevolution. This is macroevolution. This is species into species into species into species. And this is the, the cornerstone of Darwinian evolution is macroevolution. And Darwin himself said, I can see at this point in time, when I'm doing this in the late, middle, late 1800s, 1869 when he published his book, excuse me, 1859, that we are short of transitional species in the fossil record. But now that we know to look, we're going to find the species that are going to exist in the cracks here that are going to show a transition here from one to another. The missing links, they're going to be found, Darwin said. If they are not, it will be clear that my theory is wrong. Well, they've been looking now for 145 years and they still don't have one single solitary, unambiguous, transition from one species to another. And the problem is there should be hundreds, literally hundreds of them. Now what they argue is that, well, we don't have a complete fossil record yet. You can't hold us to account on this because the fossil record is not complete. 
That is true. It isn't complete. But what, they, what the reality of it is, is whole sheets of it are complete. You'll have whole sheets that are complete, and then you have sections that aren't complete. Then you'll have more sections that are complete, and you'll have sections that aren't complete. And so they're hiding behind the fact that the fossil record isn't completely filled in. But the truth of it is, within the areas, the, the, the long sheets, the, the long periods of time that are complete, there are no transitional species. So they know the theory is wrong, and they've known it for quite some time. But they can't acknowledge that it's wrong because the creationists are standing right there and going, knocking on the door, saying, well, if you don't know what's going on, we want our theory to be taught in the schools. I don't want that. The Darwinists don't want that. I don't blame them. The creationist point of view should be kept in churches where it belongs. And if they weren't so belligerent about that, the Darwinists could acknowledge and admit what they don't know, and we'd have a much better chance of getting to the truth of what really happened. But as long as the situation as it is, is as it is with the creationists, we're going to be stuck with the Darwinists pretending that somehow Darwinian evolution and the transitional species are going to be found, and they're not. Next slide. All right, this is microevolution. This is indeed a real point of fact in the world around us. These are Hawaiian honey creepers. Darwin saw this phenomenon of creatures adapting themselves in part on the Galapagos Islands. He saw it with Darwin's finches, he saw it with tortoises, he saw it with other things. And what he said was, okay, if we can see changes in parts as clearly as this, we can extrapolate, we can assume that changes in whole bodies are not out of the question and in fact are logical. And, and he was right, it is logical to assume that. But the problem is it doesn't work in reality. The evidence is just not there. There is no macro evolution. There is micro evolution. It's clear. He saw it. He saw it first and documented it. But there is no, to this day, true macro evolution. It doesn't extend past the parts. The honey creeper, still the honey creeper, still reproduces like a honey creeper, still just like a honey creeper. It's a, all these are honey creepers. That's the key. Microevolution, yes. Microevolution, no. Next slide. This is the macroevolution of man. Supposedly, we start out around 4 million years ago, maybe 5 million years ago, as a couple, as a pair of upright walking chimps and upright walking gorillas, known as the Australopithecines. And they go from around 4 million years ago, not billion now, 4 million, to around 2 million years ago, when a new type of being appears. And these are called the early homos, the early men. Early men, homo erectus, I mean homo habilis, homo erectus, down to the Neanderthal. And then suddenly around 120,000 years ago, you have a new thing that is again, is completely different as this one is from this one, from this one to this one, Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon, around 120,000 years ago in the fossil record. And what, what they're trying to tell you, make us, they want us all to believe that this is somehow a transition. When in fact, at each of these stages, there is a transformation, whole and complete. These are upright walking chimps and gorillas. These are more man-like, but they are still very unhuman-like. These are your true humans at only 120,000 years ago in the fossil record. So you go from four million years with these guys, down to two million with these, and then down to for the Cro-Magnons. Keep that in mind. Next slide. Now, walking is the key. Go back if you would, please. Right, let, me, let me stress something. Walking is the key to what makes these and these be considered pre-humans. Walking. Walking is the key. And what walking is, according to Darwin, is, is the sure sign that something is on the way to learning to be a human. They say that this has this is a process of learning. It starts with walking. They used to say the brain was first and everything followed that until they found these guys and found out they had brains like chimps and gorillas. And they said, all right, well, then it was walking. Walking came first, not tool use, not brains, walking. So walking is the key. Walking is very important. Now, the thing is, do you really learn to walk? Can you go from being a quadruped down on all fours to being upright on all twos. Can you 
biologically change your body to do that by sheer adaptation? Yes, you, you could. And here's how you have to do it. And here is the theory as it's put forth, believed and preached as gospel. That as the forests of Africa began to shrink, some group of quadrupeds decided to get out of the forests, move out onto the savannas, out onto the savannas, and begin to stand upright more and more and more and more. First, first just stand up to look over the grass and then go back down. Stand up to look over the grass for, for lions and tigers and whatever, and do that over and over and over again for hundreds and thousands of years. And in that process, as they're standing up to look over the grass for the predators that are coming to eat them, they end up, at the end of those thousands of years, standing upright like us, becoming upright walking creatures. Now, this is again, theory as it's taught and as it's believed and as it's preached. The problem is, how do you get through thousands of generations when as soon as you come out of those trees and walk out onto the savannah, you are nothing but a walking snack tree. You have no fangs, you have no claws, you have no tough skin or anything. You're just a big bag of food moving to the big cats out on the savannah. It requires that you have generation after generation doing this, altering their, their bodies as they move, as they learn to stand upright. Couldn't happen. You can't get from the beginning to the end because everything in between has been eaten by the big cats before they can reproduce and pass any modification on. You understand? Just couldn't happen. And yet, that is what they teach. Because from their point of view, it can't happen any other way. That has to be the way it happened, and yet common sense tells anybody that it could. So, where do these walking creatures come from? It's clear that they're walking. You have the tracks of Laetoli at 3.2 million years ago, perfectly upright. And we have Lucy at 3.5 million years ago. The hips and everything, pelvis arranged to walk upright. So we know they're walking upright. How, if they didn't, if they couldn't learn it in the way that we just described, we just talked about, where did it come from? Perfect answer. Never talked about. Perfect answer. Next slide. The Miocene. The Miocene era goes from around 25 million years ago out here to around 5 million years ago right here into the Pliocene. In those 20 million years, you have two dozen, two dozen genera of apes. Apes. Not monkeys. Monkeys are from 35 million years to 25 million years, you have nothing but monkeys. So they've been around about 10 million years. But when the apes, when the Miocene apes hit the scene, hit the fossil record, they dominate. Very few monkeys, lots of apes. Lots of apes. And guess what? A bunch of them, now we're talking tailless apes. 50 different species, a couple of dozen genera. We're talking a lot of different kinds. We're talking from small ones, gibbon-sized, up to man-sized, up to giant-sized. Touch that roof with their heads, Gigantopithecus. Every size ape you can imagine. And guess what else? Out of those 50 different species, 24 genera, have come only four survivors. Only four survivors. Chimpanzees, gorillas, gibbons, and rangers. What happened to the rest of them? What happened? Well, they say, science, science tells us that all of these, all of these were quadrupeds, down on all fours, because the only four that came out are, that they acknowledge are quadrupeds. But you have a real problem, next slide, with the short arm babies. A bunch of them, like Proconsul, for example, have arms that are equal in length to their legs. And so they try to say that, well, they, they must have walked like this in front of them. Because if you're a quadruped, a true quadruped, your arms have to be longer than your legs for you to walk comfortably. For you to locomote, it's not walking. For you to locomote comfortably, your arms have to be longer than your legs. So keep in mind, our arms are shorter than our legs, significantly shorter. 
But the Miocene apes have arms that are equal to the length of their legs approximately, which means that their arms would, would dangle down around their knees if they were to walk upright. These are, the short-armed apes are a real embarrassment, and this is why you don't hear much out of the Miocene. Because they don't want to imply that they were walking, but they were. There's no other way for a short-armed ape to locomote comfortably except on two feet. So it's very, very fair to assume that those short-armed Miocene apes were walking upright and that what we find in the fossil record at four and five, and now they're arguing six million years ago walking upright, are just nothing more than the Miocene apes walking right out of the Miocene doing what they'd always done, the short-armed apes walking upright. Next slide. So what they try to do with pre-humans to make you think, to, to brainwash you into believing these things really were pre-human, is that they put these butt-ugly heads on human bodies, human-looking bodies, and you come to believe, you come to think that that's how it was. When in fact, there's nothing at all human about these bodies of the pre-humans. Bones are different, bones are thicker, heavier, arms are longer. Nothing about it's the same. Next slide. And here we see the early homo now again over here to the left. What this thing's given out of here? The Australopithecines. Is it even working at all? Right, so I'm gonna just give it up and just use my hands since I'm so close. Anyway, these are the Australopithecines would be here. This is Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and then over here. Cro-Magnon, right in there. Now, all of these are indeed transitional forms. Tran transitional. This is a transformation from these to this. Just the same way that you have a transformation here from the Australopithecines to here. Transformation, and then you have basically the brains are just getting bigger. That's basically it. The brains are just getting bigger. But with the skulls themselves, the bones are very heavy compared to ours, very thick compared to ours. The brow ridges are very heavy and thick compared to ours. The eyes are big, round, night vision eyes. You eyes like this, you get night vision. Noses, look how big and wide the noses are, the nasal passages. Big, wide, flat noses. You got a mouth sticking off the face. These teeth are jutting out. It's hard to see this, but they do. They have no chins. If the jaws were here, you'd see they have no chins. They just slant back. This guy, Cro-Magnon, comes from all of this with exactly the opposite in every way. He's got a forehead. They all lack a forehead. They're, they just go back from the eyebrows. We've got a forehead. Very reduced brow ridges. Very reduced eye sockets and poor night vision. A nose pinched up off the face. A mouth squashed back in flat. And a chin sticking out. Exactly the opposite. And yet somehow that's supposed to be a transition that you go from this one looking pretty much the same, this one, this one, this one, and then suddenly, boop, totally different, and that's a transition. That is somehow a natural flow of events. No, even the Darwinists acknowledge that can't be. So they say, all right, well, yeah, we acknowledge that real problem. We're going to plug that hole with a missing link that's going to go in there and show some transition. Well, the problem is, anybody that knows anything, they need a couple of dozen to transition from this to this, you need a couple of dozen species in there to show that. They don't have a finger bone. There is no missing link in the human chain. Never has been, never going to be. There is no missing link. It's just a plug in a huge gaping hole in Darwinian theory because, again, they're trying to keep the creationists at bay as long as possible possible and they'll do anything, say anything, pull any absurdity out of the hat to keep the charade alive. That's how it works. Okay, well, if everything I'm telling you is true and these guys are not pre-humans as we're told, what are they? They're there. They're in the fossil record. They lasted for millions of years and they walked upright. What are they? They are hominoids. Hominoids. Hominoids are human-like creatures that are not really human. Hominoids. What are hominoids? Next slide. You have them here. We have them at there. They're all over the world. Every continent except Antarctica. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, 
Yahweh, Amos. They have names wherever they are in the world. They are everywhere in the world. There are deep forests, jungles, and swamps. They live in the part of the world, the parts of the world, that we don't live in. Now, we think that we are everywhere, that we know everything about our planet, that there's no place that we don't really know about, that we haven't been on, and that is absolute garbage. That is so untrue. In the United States alone, which is a very populated country, very well-covered country, in the United States alone, 25% of the land has never once been foot surveyed. Never once foot surveyors go in there. Why? Can't get in there. It's too hard. Too difficult. The terrain is too difficult. That is where they live. Here in Australia, I don't know what it is, but people were telling me that if you fly over huge parts of Australia, you just look down, it's just a blanket of trees. People never live there. I'm sure it's the same here. It's the same wherever you get the reports of these creatures living. Upright walking, hair covered primates. Just upright walking chimps and gorillas. Miocene apes. They've been going, doing like this, been living on this earth. This has been their planet since the Miocene, 20 million years ago. They've been out there making their living, living in those places where we don't live. Right now, to this day, 50% of the arable land of the earth, 50%. Take away the ice caps, take away the deserts, arable land. 50% of it considered terra incognita. We don't know what it is. We basically don't know what's out there. We don't live there. We live in about half, to any extent, in about half of the arable land of the earth. There's plenty of room for them to roam, to be, to live. Plenty of Perfect example, next slide. The panda. It was the 1800s hominoid. You know how now, in the last 50 years, we hear about the hominoids, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yahweh, all that. In the early part of the 1800s, it was the panda. Stories kept coming out of China of a black and white bear that ate bamboo. And of course, every expert in the world knew that was impossible that there were no vegetarian bears, they were omnivores, and that they were black and white, brown, other colored bears, but not two tones. Until in 1869, a French naturalist sent the hide of one back to the French Museum of Natural History, and they stuffed it and knew what it looked like. And then every scientist who had been saying that such a thing is impossible said, well, we were just maintaining healthy skepticism as scientists are supposed to do instead of admitting to the fact that they were just ruling it out because it was beyond their, their conception, their imagination. And so they said, now that we know they're for real, we're going to get off our thumbs and we're going to go out there and we're going to be the first to bring another one in. Sichuan province, China, it's not that big a place. It's just tough, rugged terrain, mountainous, with bamboo forests instead of regular forests. But other than that, how long do you think it took to bring in the next one? When they knew it was there and they were sending in top quality teams to find it, how long do you think it took? 60 years. 60 years. And then over the next 20 years, they brought in half a dozen more. And to this day, it's really hard to go out into those jungles, I mean, those uh, bamboo forests. And, and find a live panda from the wild. Why? What's the panda doing? Nothing. It's a, it's a brightly colored, slow-moving, dim-witted animal that really doesn't do anything. Lives in the day, doesn't hide, doesn't do anything sophisticated to stay out of the way of getting caught. The problem is we don't function well in its environment. But we think we function well everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. But we don't. We do not. And so, Imagine, if you will, a creature that is bigger, faster, lives at night, eats anything, can really move if it wants to, and is an absolute master of its environment, and it is smart. Now, imagine going out and trying to find that, and you can't find pandas that are really stupid animals. It isn't going to happen deliberately. You're going to see these creatures accidentally. And that's how it happens. When it happens, 
and it happens about 150 times a year around the world, good cycles. About 150 times every year. Next slide. Okay, when it happens, evidence is left behind. And the evidence in most cases is tracks. In most cases, it's tracks. We have right now, over the last 50 years that we've been keeping track, about 10,000 plaster cast photographs or both of tracks. All of which, according to the Darwinian paradigm, the Darwinian mainstream, is impossible. Because why? Hominoids can't exist. They can't exist. Not that they don't exist. They can't exist on the Darwinian paradigm crumbles. It crumbles. So, is it hard to know one way or the other whether these things do exist based on the proof that they leave behind? Yes, because they're big creatures, they're heavy creatures, and they leave tracks, and tracks are indeed readable. There's a whole branch of science called ichnology that does nothing but read the tracks left in fossil shales and other fossils of creatures that lived millions of years ago. Well, if they can read those tracks and tell you what those animals look like, they can read the tracks of hominoids and tell you what they look like. But suddenly, when it comes time to read a hominoid track, all the rules are out the window, and they have to be false. And you can't even get them out of their offices hardly to go out and take a look. Only a handful of scientists that support the reality of hominoids will go out and take a look. You can't get them to go. Why? Because it can't be real. Not that it isn't. It can't be real. Well, here's what you get when you go out and you take a look. When a living, fleshy foot, with all its multiple bones, makes a track in a suitable medium, in doing so, it pushes the medium out sequentially, smoothly, flowingly out. And what you get are lines, cracks in the inside of the tracks called compression lines. Vertical, little, little lines along in here, very easy to see. Next slide. If you take a phony foot of any kind, wood, plaster, plastic, it doesn't matter, it is not going to articulate the way a real living fleshy foot does. So when it goes down, you have to press it or stamp it, and when you do that, the medium pushes out in a completely different way. You get these, these impact ridges on the sides and the lines crack on the outside instead of the inside. Now, we can give this little lesson to a group of first graders, of six-year-old kids. Give them magnifying glasses, lay as many tracks as you want out here, phony and real, and they won't miss one. That's really how easy it is. And yet, every track that shows the compression lines that, they, that the real ones produce, in that case and that case only, can't be true. It's got to be faked. Some kind of way, the fakers have figured out how to do it. How to produce articulating feet that if, instead of making fake Bigfoot tracks all over the world, all they'd have to do is apply that technology to prosthesis and people with, with missing limbs could walk a heck of a lot better. And they'd be millionaires to boot. And remember, all this faking has been going on for like 50 years. Next slide. Here's how a human foot works. You have the heel coming down because our ankle sits to the rear of our foot. So we, we have a heel strike. We come down hard on the heel. The momentum swings around the outside of our arch. It cuts over here into the ball of our foot. It comes out, our toe, our big toe acts as a thrusting mechanism. Our four other toes act as balancers and they pull up and leave an undisturbed line of medium underneath here while this flattens out. Next slide. And what we see is a drawing of exactly that. We see the heel strike. We see the momentum swinging around the arch. We see it cut over under the ball. We see it thrust out through the big toe. And we see the four toes here acting as, as balancers and leaving an undisturbed track of medium in there. That's how we walk. Next slide. This is how hominoids walk. All of them, this is a Bigfoot track, 16 inches long, 7 inches wide. Very typical track. But it was just taken in a really nice, soft, dirt road so you got a real nice, clear print. You see something very different. You see an ankle set up here toward the middle of the foot. You see an extended heel. You see a widened heel. You see a shortened forefoot. You see a very widened forefoot. You see all five toes acting as balancers. You see the medium through here. So all the thrusting mechanism is the whole forefoot here. And most importantly, instead of that swinging around the arch and having an imbalanced kind of walk, this thing has 
Hey, no heel strike. The, the foot comes down together and the line of momentum is straight up the chute. You can see that right here. A totally different foot. A totally different foot walking a totally different way from us. And guess what? Tracks of Laotoli 3.2 million years ago. That's how they look. That's how they walk. And furthermore, they walk better than we did. Because that foot, instead of like us coming down, heel strike, toe out, heel strike, toe out, that foot's coming down thum, 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 smoothly, smoothly. This thing is walking better than us. It's keeping its knees unlocked, bent. So it's using its muscles, its muscles in its thigh, its muscles in its behind. The way to do it, the right way to do it. Its joints don't wear out like ours do. If you look at us walking in slow motion, we're actually doing it wrong. We're doing it inefficiently. We're locking our knees, we're throwing ourselves through our hips, and over time, our joints wear out. As we get old, all you have to do is go to the nursing home, you can see it. It shouldn't happen if we were walking correctly. Something is wrong. These guys do it right, we do it wrong. Next slide. Here's another one, and it's a different foot. And what, it, what this one shows is that there are different feet among the hominids. Fundamentally the same, but check the difference in the toes. These toes are all the same size. It's called the peas and pod type. But again, still, all five of them acting as balancers, forefoot, ankle in the middle, extended heel. The same, the di same different design, but with different toes. We all have the same fundamental foot. They have different ones. Very unusual. Next slide. Dermal ridges. In the best hominoid tracks, dermal ridges show up very clearly. What are dermal ridges? They're the fingerprints, your fingerprints, of your feet. You know how when a baby's born, if a hand's too small to do the fingerprints, they just do the whole foot. Boom. Print the foot. The fingerprints on your feet. Dermal ridges. What do they say? What does the Darwinist say when they see a hominoid track with dermal ridges? Whoever faked it took the time to sit down and carve them in. Carve them in. When, in fact, they're so, so fine and so complicated and each one is unique. Remember, each one is unique. Just like fingerprints. Lasers couldn't do it. And yet, somehow, those fakers have taken the trouble to sit down and make a foot that fully articulates so that it leaves compression lines and it leaves dermal ridges. Those fakers know their business. See how silly it is? It's absolutely absurd. Next slide. This is a stride comparison with a six foot man. You see the track here and the track here. See how it is. If somebody was indeed faking them and wearing fake tracks, because they, they make such, they go into the mediums at such depth that we can judge how much they weigh, we know they're weighing 500 pounds, 600 pounds, 700 pounds, 800 pounds, depends. But you can tell from the medium technology can do this. It's amazing what they can do. That means that the person who's making these tracks has to be in the range of seven, eight feet tall themselves, and they have to be very heavy people to begin with, and then they have to put three or 400 pounds on a barbell and carry that and go, <laughs> you know, making the tracks. The problem is, if it's a human foot, it, it has a re it's gonna have a deep heel print. It's gonna have the standard heel impact that we have, and those, not visible in the hominoid tracks. It's clear that these are living creatures making these tracks that don't walk the way we do. Don't walk anywhere close to us. Just forget about the size differential. The walk is not the same. Next slide. But here is the differential, I mean the difference in the way that the foot's put together. This has been studied by Grover Kranz, he was an anatomist, human anatomist, foot anatomist, and he said my estimate is that 31% of the total foot length is behind the ankle joint compared with only 23% in humans. So you see, you're looking at a fundamental redesign. Why? Because it's so much bigger, denser, thicker, heavier body. All the hominoids, whether they're small or whether they're big, and by the way, there are different sizes of them. There are pygmy sized, there are human sized, and there are the giant sized. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, those are the giant sized. Yowies, I'm sure you've heard you have tall ones and you have more human ones. We have the same thing there. Everything seems to get lumped around the big ones because the big ones are so awesome, but there are many that are seen that are human size. There are different types. Just like the Miocene apes, 
just like my CNAs. They are, these are my CNAs, living today among us. It's their planet. They are the indigenous, upright, walking primates of planet Earth, the hominoids. Okay, so we see the redesign. Next slide. We also, I want you to keep in mind the difference in the motion, the forward motion, the way the momentum carries. Much better here than here. Next slide. This is a look at the difference in the shadow or the area that they put down. And he says, thus, last line, thus the Sasquatch foot at a given, last sentence, thus the Sasquatch watch foot at a given stature has just a trace over twice the surface area of a human foot at a given size twice the surface area. Why? Because it's supporting, whatever that given size is, it's supporting a much bigger body, so you need a much broader platform and a much thicker sole to be able to walk barefoot for the entire life supporting that. So it's, as you saw in the other drawing, it's thicker on the bottom, thicker on the sole. Okay, next slide. Now, here's a comparison of a standard 10 and a half foot, about my size, and a standard big foot, 15, I mean 10 by 5 and 15 by 6 and a half. But again, keep the big foot look, the hominoid look in mind. It's very different than the human. Next slide. Now, we see another pair of them. And these, it looks like this because instead of being in dirt, this was taken from, a, from clay, from hardened clay. But otherwise, in every other respect, these are hominoid tracks, are they not? Don't they look exactly the same? Wide heel, ankle up, to the way they were. Those are, those are hominoid tracks, are they not? Wouldn't you agree? Well, they aren't, as it turns out. They are not hominoid tracks. They are, in fact, without doubt, Neanderthal tracks. Neanderthal tracks taken from the cave Toriano, Italy, 30,000 years ago. And no doubt about it, Neanderthal artifacts in the cave. These are Neanderthal tracks looking exactly like hominoid prints of this day, which would lead one to suspect that perhaps Neanderthals might be hominoids rather than prehumans. Next slide. In fact, we have the feet of Neanderthals. We don't have the feet of any other prehumans. Turns out when wild creatures eat you, the first thing they go for is your feet. It's like, you know, the cherry on the Sunday or something, you know. But for whatever reason, we have very few feet bones out of the fossil record. But we have whole feet of Neanderthals because a few of them got buried. A few got buried. And so, what we have is a comparison here of a Neanderthal foot, human foot, human foot, Neanderthal foot, and look at the difference. You have the huge extension of the heel here relative to this. You have the ankle moving forward and widening compared to this. You have the flattening of the arch compared to this. And most importantly, look at the kind of sway that you have here in our foot. You can just see the imbalance caused by our momentum working around our arch, as opposed to this big, flat, poop, solid thing with the heel, the big, wide ankle by compar comparison shifted forward, the widening of the forefoot, the forefoot being the thrusting mechanism, the big toe here being the dominant one of the four little um, balancers as opposed to these big, all five of them working as balancers. This is a very different, it's the same bones, it's amazing, isn't it? The same bones completely redesigned for a different function. And understand that this foot is wrapping around here like it's a big, wide foot relative <coughs> to this slim little thing here. Everything that you see in a hominoid foot is sitting right here in a Neanderthal foot. Next slide. Same with the comparing with the drawings. You see the, the difference very clear. Just what the guy drew is what you get and what you see. Pre-human feet are hominoid feet. There's no doubt about it. All of the pre-humans that's all the Australopithecines, that's all the early homos, up through Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon, those are hominoids. Not pre-humans, just Miocene apes living their lives and leaving their traces in the fossil record. Humans don't <coughs> appear in the fossil record until 120,000 years ago, suddenly, overnight, like everything else. Next slide. So what they, what they do now, try to get you to believe part of the brainwashing is that 
Neanderthals, which initially were considered brutes, pretty much like what they are, they're now just ugly humans wearing furs. Why? Because Neanderthals clearly lived during the Ice Ages in where the Ice Ages were at their worst. So somehow they were living at sub-zero temperatures, and so they wrap them up in fur. You take any of these guys and you put them one night above the Arctic Circle, just above the Arctic Circle, which is not as bad as it was during the Ice Ages, and those, those folks are dead. One night. Dead. Fur is not going to make, not going to get a human through that. You have to have a different physiology to survive that kind of climate. And the Neanderthals clearly did, because they did it from a couple hundred thousand years. They were covered in fur. They had a different physiology than we did. So if you want to see the true face of Neanderthal, next slide, it's going to look an awful lot more like this, which is brilliant, than anything like what you just saw, like what you were told to believe, what you were taught to believe. Nothing human on the horizon until you get to Cro-Magnon. Everything prior to that looking like this, covered with hair. Hum. Hum. Next slide. Now, if everything I'm telling you is true, how, how, where did we come from? If the earth belongs to the upright indigenous primates from, uh, from Miocene hominoids, where did we come from? How did we get here? Well, I choose to believe the best evidence that I have is from the work of a man named Zechariah Sitchin, which I'm not going to go into in great detail here, but just to tell you that Sumer, the original culture that we have, that we accept, that scientists scholars accept as the first one around 5,000 years ago. Sumer, which is modern-day Iraq, Tigris Euphrates, modern-day Iraq, where the wars are going on. That culture appeared out of nowhere. They came from the Stone Age, out of the Zagros Mountains, supposedly, down into the valley there, and produced this fantastic culture that, that gave us over a hundred of the firsts that we attribute to a society. Now, how did they do that? How did they produce a culture that was as good as and in many ways better than the later Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans? Come right out of the Stone Age and boom, just explode with this wonderful culture. How did they do that? Well, we don't talk about it. They just leave that one off the table because it's just too impossible to explain. And all you were really taught about the Sumerians, if you went to school and you were taught anything about the Sumerians at all, you were taught one thing, you were it right. Of the hundred and some things they had introduced, Next slide. They introduced writing, cuneiform. And why? Because we have over a hundred, it would be that would be denied if we didn't have the hundred thousand plus tablets, many of which got stolen, by the way, when the Americans invaded. You might remember that both the tablets and silver seals were confiscated but disappeared. But nonetheless, only it's unfortunate because only about 20% of them had been translated at that point. But of the 20% that were translated, Many, about 5,000 of them, told things about their history. Most of them were about business and business deals and who, who owned who, how many sheep, or, or whatever. But about 5,000 of them told stories that the Sumerians believed about themselves, about their history. <clears throat> That's all considered mythology. Our scientists consider it total mythology because it just can't be true, the things they were saying. They were saying things like this, that multiple gods came down from the heavens, lived on the earth, needed a slave and a servant, created that slave and a servant in a house of fashion, basically a genetic engineering lab. And not only did they create humans to be their slaves and servants, they created domesticated plants and domesticated animals to give the gods their ease. <coughs> now, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. I think the evidence is there that somebody was here, whether it was the Anunnaki as the Sumerians called them, or somebody else. Somebody, a superculture was here in the dim past, and they left their fingerprints all over the place. We just refuse to acknowledge that their fingerprints are here. Next slide. One of the things that these people left us with, with the legacy of is an explanation for how the Earth came to be like this. The Earth itself. All liquid bodies in a vacuum form themselves into a tight spherical ball. You've all seen milk get loose in the space shuttle and all that. It all forms into a ball. This is what liquids do in a vacuum. 
All other astral bodies that we know of, except for the meteorites and comets, which are started out as pieces of this, supposedly, and the planets exploding and things like that, to create them. But anything that formed as a viscous mass, which clearly the Earth did, forms in a complete smooth ball. What happened to the Earth? The Sumerians have an explanation. Our guys are still trying to figure it out. That's in my book. It's in Sitchin's book, if you want to find out more about it. Point is, there are some answers. Next slide. Another basic proof of the existence of these multiple super people, super gods, whatever you want to call them, are megalithic structures around the world. Megalithic structures at Saxomon like these. If I was standing here, I wish I was in this picture, I'd be about right, my head would be about right here. That's how big they are. High in the mountains of above Cusco, impossible for humans to have put this together, and yet we are told that they did so. And the same holds true for Tiwanaku, Teotihuacan, Baalbek in Lebanon, Stonehenge, around the world. Any megalithic structure we want to talk about, humans somehow did it because nothing else is allowed. No outside intervention is permitted. So they have to explain it in rational, natural terms. And so they just say, somehow, they did it. But we can't do it today. We cannot begin to reproduce this kind of precision in our work today. Next slide. Laying one stone every 8.5 minutes. Now, right there, that story is over with. Right there, that story is a fraud. That story is absurd. And yet, it, they, the Egyptologists will not hear that it couldn't be done. More than that, they weren't just slamming these things into place like these look like they were, but still they were being laid pretty carefully because they were all flat and they all worked out such that they went up to the top perfectly. But here's what's the amazing thing. They were covered with polished limestone, each of which was placed to perfection. And it couldn't be any other way because if you have mistakes down at the bottom, the size of the postage stamp, they're the size of the car at the top. Every single stone in these three pyramids had to be perfect, and they were. Next slide. Thank goodness, after the, while they were stripping off the, the covering limestone, they left a few down at the bottom so you could see how marvelous the workmanship was. And here it is. This is a connecting line between two of the stones. It's the width of a human hair. Next slide. See it? Coin, connecting line right here. We cannot, in our wildest dream, put stones together with this kind of accuracy. Not in our wildest dreams can we do this on a massive scale. This is a Rolex watch, folks, built to the size of a mountain. Real. Impossible today. And yet somehow these primitive people did it using ropes and stone tools and wood rollers to move the stones. Wood they did not have and don't grow in the, in the Nile Valley. They would have had to import them from Lebanon, which would back then, 3,500 years ago, would have been, you know, a tough effort. Okay, next slide. The Sphinx. We've all seen him too. I want to look at this wall over here for a minute. Next slide. I hope you've all seen the mystery of the Sphinx and seen the idea that this is caused by running water. These, these are running water marks. After the Sphinx was carved out, the walls were smoothed over and gouged by running water. Well, what does that mean? That the Sphinx was carved at a minimum of eight to 10,000 years ago, before the desert desiccated in that area. With me? It's more likely that it's more like 15 to 16,000 years ago to have it sitting there and give enough rain time so that all this could happen. Well, 15 to 16,000 years ago. No Egyptologist has done enough of that. But they've had it pretty much crammed down their throats. So some of them are beginning to say, well, yeah, maybe that happened. But then the pyramids were still made within that 100-year period. But they're trying their very best to get the, the Sphinx back on the page and at the same time as the pyramids. Next slide. But however or whenever it was done, one thing is for sure. When they cut these stones out of here, they moved some of them, they moved, they moved them up here to build two temples, the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple. Next slide. And as you see this, looking the other way now, Sphinx here, 
Sphinx Temple, Valley Temple, you see the size of some of the stones. And they too were, by the way, covered with those perfect polished limestones that got stripped off to build buildings in Cairo, which I think is one of the great sins of the past. People doing that, ruining the beauty and the perfection of these things. But nonetheless, they did in the year four. We're left with the next slide. We have, this is me back when I was younger and had hair and was cool and was a snappy dresser. Uh, no, it's not true. I never had hair and I was never cool. And I Still not snappy. But anyhow, this was another guy. But you see 170 tons of stone, just one of them. In the pyramids, 1,500, not that unusual. On the inside, all of it perfect, the end perfect. But here's what it takes to move 170 tons. Next slide. Today, this big bumper right here. And to move it from where you saw that drawing out, it would be three or four days to set up each time to move it just a little bit. And then you have to put it down, you have to roll this thing forward and rehook and do, you know, eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes, all you got. To move a 170 ton stone. And there are stones all over the world. Way bigger than 170 tons. Next slide. One of my favorites is the ancient 1,000, 1,170 ton obelisk, the unfinished obelisk at Aswan. Pink granite, one of the hardest stones in the world. Cut out, obviously, with some other stone that was harder than it, but we, we don't know where they would have gotten it. But nonetheless, they carved it out of this hole. It's in a hole. The guy that's taking the pictures up on, up on land, and there's the edge of the right, it's about 15 feet deep in a hole. And yet, as you can see, it's been worked and polished and it's pretty much done. And they're just finishing off the spire. And something is digging out pink granite in chunks the size of the seats that you're sitting on. Some big machine just gouging. And as that machine presses down, it cracks. It finds a fault and it cracks. And those building it with that machine just say, oops, we broke it. They unhook it off the nose and they go away and they just leave it for us to marvel at. For, now understand, they fixed a bunch of them. I mean, they did a bunch of them perfectly. And you've got obelisks, huge, gigantic obelisks around Egypt. And then they got stolen and taken to other parts of the world. But here's this one, which is, you know, average size. Problem. Problem. How do you get it out of the hole? Better yet, even bigger problem. How do you cut it loose from its base? With the finest drill we have today, covered in diamonds, you could not make it go through there. The weight would press it down and compress it and not let it go. How did these primitive people cut this stone, which is very much loose, according to the Darwinists, according to, I mean, according to scientists, rather, according to the Egyptologists, some poor schmuck got down there with his little stone axes and went to hammering and somehow worked his way all the way through and underneath and worked their way. They would have been crushed. I mean, there's just no physical way to do this, folks. None. And, but if you could, if you could somehow do it. Next slide. This is what it would take to move only a thousand tons. It doesn't get much bigger. And yet, you have stones in Baalbek, Baalbek, Lebanon, that are 2,000 tons. 2,000 tons. Unbelievable. And yet, there they sit up in a wall, high up in a wall, in the Temple of Baalbek. Primitive people did that. It's just like the hominoids. How? Why? Because they had to. No intervention is allowed. Are you laughing or are you coughing? Coughing. Okay. Good job. You okay? You need some water? All right, if it's, if it's true, next slide, then they were, if that they were here, we have other evidence to show that they were. We have the, as I said earlier, domestication of plants and animals. What the story we're told now is that all domesticated plants and animals, and pretty much seems to be this way, all domesticated plants and animals come in a period from 10,000 years ago to 5,000 years. 10,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. We've had none since, really, that amount to anything. The big, big, big ones, the sheep, the cattle, the goats, the corn, the man.
maize, I mean, the, the corn, the wheat, barley, all that came within that period. Stuff we really use. Now, how is that explained? Well, in terms of the plants, it's explained this way. Somehow, these Stone Age people looked out of the cave one day, and one of them got the bright idea that, hey, if we pull up some of these grasses and grains and cereals that we're looking at, which are out there today, look at them today and see, with their little bitty tiny, tiny seeds that are the size of pepper flakes or salt crystals, and hard as start salt crystals, and biochemically only suited to feeding grazing animals, this, this Stone Age wizard got the idea hey, if we pick through those little pepper flakes and salt crystals and pick out the biggest ones that are marginally bigger than the others, and we plant them, figuring out how to plant and grow, and plant them and make them produce a crop, and then we pick out the biggest ones of that, and them produce a crop, over a couple of thousand years or more, over a couple of thousand years or more, those little bitty pepper flake salt crystal seeds will grow into something we can actually use, you know, see easily and use in our hands. They will soften, the seeds will soften and turn from rocks into something that we can actually cook and eat. And, and the biochemistry of them will change so that they're not suitable for animals anymore, but they're suitable for us, that our bodies can use them. It, won't that be cool? And that cave guy supposedly talked all his buddies into doing this and doing it for generation after generation after generation after generation, planting and sowing and picking out the best and somehow doing this something we can't do today. Not been able to do and reproduce today, but somehow these, this genius did it. And not only that, multiple geniuses did it because this was done all over the world in different places at different times within that 5,000 years. And you get things that go from being these wild, hardy grasses like teosinte into, from this, to corn. Next slide. And you go from this hardy little perennial that can just grow anywhere, anytime, doesn't need anything up to grow, to this, which is riddled with genetic defects. I mean, riddled to the point where it can't live by itself. Without human intervention, corn as we know it, not, it won't grow. Doesn't matter. We need it. We use it. We're happy to have it. But it is clearly not a natural, not a natural species of anything. This is natural. This is very natural. Next slide. Same thing with wheat and ember. Early wheat and ember. Same process where you go from these little tiny grass-like things into a much bigger seed, a much plumper seed, softer seed, and its biochemistry changes from feeding animals to feeding us. These, these Stone Age geniuses somehow pull that off. And more than that, next slide, what, every, what they had to do with every one of the domesticated plants that they were going to turn into grains and cereals and grass that they were going to turn into food, they had to, to solve the problem of branches and blooms. Now, blooms are the husks that wrap around the seeds, and branches are this area right here where they break off. Now, in the wild, rachis and blooms have a, a cycle where they're pretty tough when the seed is growing to hold it on to the stem during windstorms and rain and all that. But as it matures and when it matures, they turn incredibly brittle so that the seeds can propagate. You know, you pick up a dandelion and it's gone, right? That's, that's the rachis letting go. Rachis and blooms. The seed popping out of the bloom, the rachis letting it go. That's how wild things are. Well, if the rachis and blooms stay the same, it didn't matter how big it got, you couldn't harvest it. Because when it ripened, what would happen? If you hit it with a scythe, every one of the seeds would drop on the ground. You couldn't collect them. Somehow, the rachis had to, I mean, the blooms had to be made strengthened past the period of ripening so that they would, they would hold together during harvesting. Somehow the righteous had to do the same thing, but the righteous had to be set so that when you harvested it and got it back to where you wanted to, to thrash it and get the seeds out, in the thrashing process, the righteous had no one to let go. It had to be perfect. It 
had to be precise for every single cereal, grass, and grain that was domesticated. So in addition to the biochemistry and the changing of the size of something, you had to solve these two problems for each one. Each one was different. Each one had to be perfect. As perfect as the stones of the pyramid, they were. They were. That's what's impossible to accept, that humans could have done this. Impossible. Next slide. Same thing with the animals. Except it's different. Instead of making little bitty seeds bigger, softer and all that. They took big, tough, bad news animals and shrunk them down and made them gentle. Gentle their spirits. Changed them psychologically. Changed their brains. Wild goats? Domesticated goats. Wild barks cattle? Domesticated cattle. Shrunk them down and made them docile and made them domestic so that they could serve man. Give the gods their ease, as it says in the Sumerian texts. No doubt about it. Next slide. Same thing with pigs, from wild boar to domesticated pig. Imagine bringing this sucker, the first one, and what they say is, of course, the farmers that were growing those, domestic, domesticating the plants were at the same time domesticating the animals. And another one had the bright idea, let's take these wild, bad news animals, bring them in, live with them, gentle them down over generations, and turn them into things we can use way downstream from our lives. Not going to happen. Absolutely absurd. Imagine the first guy bringing anything wild in. These big barks, cattle, bad news, wolves, turn them into dogs. Just didn't going to happen. Next slide. The cheetah, the king of domestication. Okay, this, if nothing else proves it, this does, that, that genetic engineering took place in the distant past. The cheetah is a hunting cat, a cat designed to hunt at a very high level of ability. Efficiency. Not that cats aren't good hunters, but nothing is like this the cheetah on the savannah. It's the fastest animal in the world by far, 70 miles an hour. 70 miles an hour. Good racehorse will run 40 top speed. Okay? Not only that, it is designed to hunt. It's got a different aerodynamically designed body, more like a greyhound than a true cat. You know how heavy lions and tigers and all the hunting cats are? This one is slimmed down like a dog, like a, like a greyhound. More than that, it's got a different attitude. It doesn't have a cat attitude. It's, the, it's one of the very first domesticated animals. We have records of it going back almost to 10,000 years ago in Asia, India, and Africa. It was very widespread. Very tame. The pharaohs used to hunt with these guys. Okay? They were hunting in animals designed for that purpose. There has never been a report of a cheetah attacking and killing a human. They have dog mentality in cat bodies. They have dog-like bodies in the sense that the bones are much lighter, the lungs have been modified, the breathing rate has been modified like no other dog in the world. But more importantly than that, get this, they have dog feet. With cat feet, soft pads and retractable claws, you can't make a turn at 70 miles an hour. But with a dog foot, a thick, heavy pad, and a permanently extended claws, you're running on track shoes. You can turn at 70 miles an hour. The cheetah among all cats has dog feet. More than that, you see this brown fur? That's short-haired dog fur. See those black spots? Cat fur. Cheetahs sit like a dog. They get dog-only diseases, they get cat-only diseases. Now, as if that isn't bizarre enough about cheetahs, guess what? They all have the same DNA. Same chromosome package. They're clones. You can take a cheetah from Africa and you can take a cheetah from Asia. You could strip their skin off of them and swap the skin and it would heal. You could trade hearts, no rejection. They're all the same. Now, when faced with this evidence, what do you think the Darwinists and the geneticists and the scientists said? What do you think they came up with? There had to be an answer, and there had to be a natural answer. So they came up with one. 
these cheetahs got squeezed through a bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck. And here's the bottleneck. Somehow, somehow, before 10,000 years ago, every cheetah on earth, in Asia, India, Africa, all of them died except for one breeding pair, or, or just a couple. And then they repopulated from those. That's why they all have the same genes, because they came from the same two original ones. Isn't that plausible? Doesn't that make sense? No, of course not. It's just an excuse. And yet, it's taught, it's preached, it's believed like everything else they put out. It's garbage. All right, next slide. There you're looking at somebody else who got put through a bottleneck. We got put through a bottleneck. Same thing. Everybody in this room has been put through the same kind of bottleneck that the cheetahs went through. Why? Because in 1987, as you see here, Newsweek magazine, it was found by a study of, of mitochondrial DNA of women around the world. Women have carried, women produce and carry mitochondrial DNA forward. We all have it. Males have it, but we don't pass it on. It passes on through the egg. So they did a study of women around the world and they found that we did not, in fact, descend from any creatures four million years ago, which is what they went into the experiment looking to prove was it closer to five or eight or, you know, when did we really separate from our last common ancestor with the apes as was believed at the time? They found that the oldest of us, the oldest of us were only about 200,000 years old. 200,000. Not millions of years old. We were like brand new. A brand new species. Which matches up pretty well with the Cro-Magnons at 120,000 years ago. If our mitochondrial DNA says we're only between 150 and 200,000 years old, that matches up pretty well with when our fossils begin to appear. And furthermore, the oldest of us come from southern Africa, making Adam and Eve black. If there was an Adam You can imagine how this went over in the south of the United States. But nonetheless, that's the way it would be. The oldest of us come from southern Africa. And we only start up as a species around 100, 150 to 200,000 years old. So what does that mean? Just like the cheetahs. All of us got wiped out. And you know that we have Homo erectus in, all over there, you know, in, in, in India, in China, in Asia and in Africa. All of those got wiped out. The ones that were going to become us, leaving only a couple or a couple of pairs to produce us within the last 200,000 years. Same bottleneck, same kind of story that worked with the cheetah. They expected to work with us, and it has worked. People just you know, buy that. No question. Thanks so. Well, it's not true. We, we are supposedly descended from primates. And yet, all of this about us is not the same. We don't have the same bones, same muscles, same skin, same adipose tissue, same body hair patterns, head hair and nails are different, skulls and brains are different, locomotion is different, speech is different, sex is different, genetic disorders. We have over 4,000 genetic disorders, folks. How would we get over 4,000 genetic disorders worked into the whole gene pool in only a couple hundred thousand years? When you consider that a, at least two dozen of them, actually two dozen, about 24 or 25, kill you dead before you reach the age of maturity, before you can pass that on, before you can, can reproduce. How does a disorder like that get into the whole gene pool. How can you find it among Eskimos and Watusis? There's only one way. They were put there, put there, just like the corn's genetic disorders, just like other domesticated plants and domesticated animals. And genetic disorders were put there because they were the result of cutting and splicing in a lab as they were being put together. Mistakes get made. It's the only way you get that many ge genetic disorders and genetic disorders that kill you before you can reproduce. But most importantly, 
our chromosome package has been reduced from 48 chromosomes with all other primates to 46. How do we go for, to be so much better, supposedly, while losing two full chromosomes? That's a lot of DNA. How could that happen? Next slide. Well, we look and we see a comparison of human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And you see that, as you've heard, there's a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities between us. And so they use this as an argument to say, well, you know, it's, it's clear that we evolved from them because our gene package is so close. It's only that funny little change from 48 chromosomes to 46. A little bump in the road. But otherwise, it's clear to see that we evolved from them. But let's look at that change. Next slide. Here we see an M, it just so happens, the second and third chromosome. But the chimp and the gorilla and orangutan, they're separate. But with us, look, they've been fused. Fused. Two genes fused. This doesn't happen in nature. That's only done in a lab. You don't see that anywhere else but in the lab. Just like you don't see the cheetahs chromosomal similarity anywhere but in a lab, a genetics lab, lab rats, clones. We, just like Darwin said, are domesticated animals created to serve a purpose by the super race, whoever you want to call them, who were here and who built the pyramids and who created the domesticated plants and who created the domesticated animals. They created us too. This is the star child skull. Answering Karina's question. The star child is composed of undeniably mammalian bone with the major human components evident. Front of bone, sphenoid, temporal, parietal, and occipital back here. However, each part is profoundly redesigned with the bone itself astonishingly reconstituted into something uniformly less that one half as thick as normal, weighing one half as much as it should. It feels kind of like a dry gourd in your hand, right? And by the way, the model is the same weight, so you'll see. Right, the real human skull, you see how thin that bone is there? It's like that all over. Weighs half as much, half as thin. It's, it's incredible. Uniform. Taking 30 points of reference on it, point, 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 30 points of reference on it, and comparing them to the average of those same 30 points on 100 normal skulls, the result falls 10 standard deviations from the statistical norm off the chart. The next slide suggests but do not yet prove that the star child is from a being other than a normal human. This is significant, folks. Next slide. What we see in comparison of the two skulls that were found is that they're completely different. Now let me give you the background on how they were found. About 1930, 
a woman, a young girl, about 15 years old, of Mexican heritage, was taken by her parents to visit the old family homestead in a small village about 100 miles southwest of Chihuahua. We do not know exactly where that village was, so we can't just run back there. We, we think we can find it, but we don't know it at this point where it was. But at that village, she was told not to go into the caves and the mine tunnels in the area. That, number one, it was dangerous. Number two, it was just forbidden. It was taboo. Don't do it. Tell most any teenager anywhere what not to do, and, you know, they want to find a way to try to do it. So she snuck off and went exploring. And she went into a mine tunnel, and she found a human skeleton lying on its back. And she, she got close to it. She noticed that there was what she called a misshapen hand coming up out of the dirt beside that skeleton, lying on the ground. And that hand was wrapped around the upper arm bone of the human skeleton. And she noticed, as she got even closer, that the dirt was all crumbly and loose beside the skeleton and over that hand that was coming up. So using her own hands, and this bears out because in a mine tunnel there would have been no rain, there would have been no compacting of the soil, and it would have been as loose as the day that the, the grave was dug, which we know from carbon-14 testing of both these skulls was 900 years ago, plus or minus 40 years. Both skulls tested out that way, so pretty likely that this story is true. So with her own hands, she dug out and she found the full skeleton there, and she said that it was smaller than the human, and the human is about a five foot tall female, so the skull, the skeleton would have been about four feet tall, and that it had a misshapen body. That's all she said, because she didn't know that some years after her death it would be important. But she, she, from the age of 15, she smuggled the two skulls, not the full skeletons, just the two skulls, back to the States, shellacked both skulls on the outside. You see that shine is from shellac put them in a cardboard box, and just kept them until it came time for her to die in the early 90s. And she willed them to another couple, friends of hers, and they put that box in their garage and kept it for five years, but didn't like two skulls in a cardboard box in their garage. So they said, the wife said, find somebody else. So they had a younger couple that they knew that were UFO knowledgeable. They were into UFO stuff. And they showed them this skull, the weird, they showed them both skulls, they said, would you like to have one when they saw this one? They said, boy, that looks like you can go in the head of a parade, doesn't it? Yeah. So let's, we, we'll take it. And they said, take it, good riddance. So they did. And then they contacted me because of my work in human origins that you saw. I was already known for my work with skulls and, and bones already. So they contacted me and they said, could you take this and get it tested by scientists to find out what it is. And I said, yeah, sure, this is so cool, this is so unique, this is so different, I mean, an idiot can see, that surely scientists will jump all over this and we'll have this tested out probably within uh, six months or so. Which could have been the case if scientists were really scientists, interested in finding out the truth, but they're not. They're interested in keeping their peers off their necks and covering their bodies. And so we couldn't get the help that we wanted and anticipated. And so now, here we are, instead of six months down the road with the answers, we will be six years. Six years, really pathetic. Jeez, it is. It's, it's sorry. It's a, it's a miserable performance by everybody involved, including myself. Not much of a fundraiser. I just don't know how to do that glad handy kind of thing that fundraisers do. I just put it out there and tell people, here's what we need, here's what we, why we need it expecting to cough it up, and they never do. Because it turns out that, in the States at least, the UFO community is very social. They like the game. They don't want the game over with. They all say they do. They all say they want answers. And you present them with something that might provide answers, might really absolutely convince everybody that this is a real phenomenon. It's, and they skitter the other way. They don't want the party to be over. That's a fact. That's what I have found to be the case. You can argue with that if you want to, but that's my experience. It's fun. It's a social thing. And they don't want to know what it is. 
and so they don't really support it very well. So that's why I'm talking to you almost six years later, and we're still struggling. And but for one woman, it would be over with, and this would be back in a, you know, a box somewhere. But for one woman in England. Okay, now, when you look at the two things, that's, that's the backstory. That's how it all came to be. When you look at two things, the first thing you notice, obviously, is the eye sockets. If I stick my finger in a human eye socket, any of yours, mine, anybody's, it'll go about that deep, about two inches. Our eye sockets are deeper and bigger than you suspect. Put them in the star child, as you'll see for yourself, it'll go maybe up to there. Not quite an inch at its deepest point. As you notice, the optic foramens, where the optic nerve and the blood vessels and all are come into, are back in the center of the cone in the back. They've been pushed down to the bottom here. If this thing has eyes like we do, they're sitting about right here, rather than back in deep like ours. But if it has eyes like we do, because it's so shallow, they're sticking off the face like frog eyes. In a very dangerous position for a kid growing up, just doing the normal things that kids do. They can pop right out of their head. So maybe it doesn't even have eyes quite like we have. But one thing significant about it is, when you take this to anybody, any, any specialist that will say anything about it, they'll say, well, it looks like, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't look like it's got to be, as, uh, as Bigfoot can't be real, and the cheetah and all that. It's got to be, got to be some kind of genetic or birth defect. Genetic defect or birth defect, because that's the only two possibilities. Now, let's look at it for a minute. Genetic defect. No genetic defect produces anything approaching this. We've looked at every manual, every book, every thing we can find, and not just me. We have a craniofacial plastic surgeon named Ted Robinson in Canada who spent six weeks trying to find anything similar to this. Can't find a genetic defect that produces anything like these effects. So eliminate genetic defects. You take it to any specialist, and they'll all say the same thing, that, that birth defects one time only, sperm egg misconnects are capable of producing anything. Absolutely anything is possible. It's just like this huge big garbage bin where they can dump anything they don't want to deal with. Birth defect. One time only, sperm egg misconnect. But in fact, there are rules to that game. Sperm egg misconnects. Everything is ugly. Everything is asymmetrical. Nothing is all-encompassing. Nothing is all-encompassing. Now, you can have something born completely without a head. You can have something born completely without a brain. I've heard of those, I'm sure. But normally, they don't live. They're dead out of the chute. This thing lived, and lived apparently for quite some time, as it was. Well, 900 years ago, plus or minus 40 years, you were born in a primitive isolated village in Mexico, and you had one thing wrong with you. You had a cleft palate. You might make it. You had two things wrong with your face and your head. And you were now skating on thin ice. They might choose not to keep you and start over. It's a new one. You were born with three things wrong with your head. You were done for. You were a faulty copy, and you were gotten rid of. That's another reason why we don't have 4,000 genetic disorders in a natural way because nature weeds out the defects. And all animals, parents, get rid of the faulty copies. And humans did that too, only up until recent times. Infanticide was not a problem in the old days. If you had a faulty copy, you got rid of it and you started over. Because babies were just, they came, they just came. You with me? So, that being the case, one would have to argue that something with everything wrong with its head, everything, there's nothing right about this. Nothing the same except the parts would not have been kept, would not have been allowed to live, couldn't have lived, and yet it did. Not only that, it is symmetrical. It's not asymmetrical, it's not ugly, it's not lopsided. Like any other birth defect that you see, the skeleton of, if you, if you see it, it's wonderfully well put together. It's just put together different. Its genes told it to grow in a completely different way. Furthermore, it's so subtle 
It's so subtle in its symmetry that you can look at these eye sockets and you can look at the copy and see. You can look at them and you cannot see anything other than a nice, nice smooth scoop in both of them. Your eyes see nothing but smoothness, but yet you put your fingers, your fingers are much more sensitive. <coughs> you put your fingers in here, you can feel a dent right here, right here. Drag your finger at this angle right here, you'll feel a little rise right in here, right in here, and you'll sink back down into another little dent right here. Absolutely perfect on both sides. Absolutely perfect in subtlety of the shifts of the train of the eye sockets. No possibility that that is a defect causing this to look this way. Its genes told it to grow this way. If its genes told it to grow this way, its genes are not human. This is not the way humans look. This is not the thickness of human bone. This is not the weight of human bone. Next slide. Oh, excuse me. Uh, what's this? You want me to hear that's not all the glass of it, not the other things. Um, the only other stuff, there's no holes for the only nerve you go through. No, I think there is. Yeah, it's in here. You can see it right there. They're in there. Yeah. There they are. It, it, the pictures aren't always revealing of everything, but the optic nerve holes are, in fact, there, both of them. And, you know, they're there. Round, little round holes, you can see them. They're not as clear on the model as they are in the real one. Is that, are they bones? Are they bones on it? Are they These you're talking about? No. If the the nose is broken off. The face, this is just broken off here. Okay? The lower part of the face is broken off. But it, it was there at one time, and we have a piece of maxilla that we'll see later. If you just wait, probably most of your questions will be covered as we go through. But yeah. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. Here's a point that needs to be made, and, and the gentleman has pointed out it's good. In a normal human skull, the, the cheekbone wraps around here, and as you see, it wraps in and forms part of the orbit of the eye. This is what he's talking about. You see how it folds in and there's no line of demarcation? And, and this line here comes down through here. You see that? The orbit, it's a rounded piece of bone. Here, <coughs> not so. It snaps off clean. Pretty major difference. We don't know how this happens here because that could not happen there. But it's just one of many, many differences that you want to see. Good point, and thank you for bringing that. Okay, next slide. Can okay, we see a side view? Again, the same parts of the bone. Now, this human skull was cradle board. You take this to experts, and they'll say, "Oh, it's a it's a cradle board and hydrocephalic." That's the first thing that pops out of most of, most of their mouth. A hydrocephalic because the head, the cranium is swollen relative to that. It's swollen and misshapen. Hydrocephaly meaning water <laughs> on the brain. All her facts. <coughs> Cradle boarded because of the flatness of the rear of the head. And that's all they want to know. I mean, you start beginning to give them arguments about why you know, it's not hydrocephalic or it's not cradle boarded. They're showing you the door. They have made their statement. They have explained it in their terms, in natural terms, cradle board and hydrocephalic, forget about it. I mean, I had the late Stephen Jay Gould himself, the man, the number one guy, do that to me. Cradle board and hydrocephalic, no sir, Mr. Gould, it's not for this reason. I don't care what it is, it's natural. Take it away. Standard response. Well, it's not. This is a cradle board and skull, right here. Now, cradle boarding is very common in primitive cultures. What it is is mother has a baby, she's got to go to work in three or four days, back to work. They need her hands. So she's got to strap her baby onto her back. If she is stooping and bending and stooping and bending, she can't have the baby's head lolling around like that because it will snap its neck. So she has to tie the baby's head to a board to keep it on her back so she can work. And, and it's very, again, very common. What you get because a baby's bones are so soft is the back of a head that comes out as flat as the board you put it on, as flat as that table. If you feel the back of her head, it is as flat as a board. I mean, no bumps at all. You feel the back of this head, you can feel it for yourself, and you'll feel the subtle convolutions of the bone. It was never cradled. Never cradled. 
And it's not a hydrocephalic because, as you'll see in a moment, there's a ridge down the middle up here. And if it was pressure from pushing from the inside of the brain pushing out, that crease would not be there. It's not cradle boarded, it's not hydrocephalic. However, when a skull is cradle boarded, the cradle boarding always stops at the knot at the rear of the head called the external, external occipital protuberance of the inium. Reach around everybody and feel that knot in the back of the center of your head, right? Right back right here. Okay? Everybody has that. It's a knot and your neck starts right underneath it. If you were cradle boarded as an infant, it stops there. It goes from the crown up here to there. It's about the size of the palm of my hand, the area that gets flat. But you can't go past the Indian because you're tearing into the neck muscles if you do that. This thing has no Indian at all. It's a dent, as you'll see in a moment. And its neck doesn't start till down here. It's got a very small neck. This neck starts up here and covers all this area here. Next slide. You see those lines just to show that it's balanced when I'm trying to fudge it. Next slide. Oh, excuse me. Can you go back real quick? Sure. Show you. Ears. Ear hole. Ear hole. Cheekbone. See this little nub right here? Cheekbone that would come up and attached here where it's torn off. You can get two fingers up through here in the real skull. My two fingers fit very easily up through here. A couple of soda straws will fit through here. The chewing muscles co that come up and attach, chewing muscles, they come up through here, go up through here. This whole area right here. You can see it clearer in another place in the mind. Chewing muscles cover this whole area. You search out, you come up through here, you cut down through here. Much, much reduced to chewing muscles, much smaller lower face. And, and, and when I say reduced, I don't mean they're going to grow as, as it gets older. They, you're born with them fitting up here. This thing was born with them fitting down here. Born differently. Neck, all this. Neck completely reconfigured like everything else. Looks like. Rear of the head. The, ox the sutures, you know about sutures, right? A baby's born with all this wide open with ligaments in here, little patches of bone, so that the head can shape to fit through the birth canal. Over the next two years or so, these sutures close up, and the last one closes up here at the top, the soft, the soft spot where the three of them will come together. All right, looks like the occipital here, this occipital, has been just stretched out and flattened. You see the crease down the middle here, the, the top? This area here, which is now a dent, is where the Indian should be, right here. It's not. And you see the neck muscles attaching and going through here. Big, big fossa where the neck muscles attach and go through. Well, you see they don't attach till down here, about an inch below where they should. So the neck is a much, much smaller, much reduced neck. Just like a much reduced face. And the crown, again, completely different relative to what it should be. These bones here, called Wormian bones, indicate that it's more than four and a half, five years old. That it's up in the teens, maybe even twenties. Not necessarily a child, but there's a lot of debate on how old it was when it died because its teeth look very childlike. Top of the head, showing what a difference. The staining, by the way, on the star child and you saw on its cheek is from the fact that it was buried in soil and probably picked up some stain from being buried. Next slide. Okay, here we see the, the underside. Now, this bone right here, the basal part, basal part, is missing here. This bone fuses in all of us by around the age of 25. So this one was post-25, this female, when she died. The one that died with it. And by the way, we first thought initially that it was its mother, maybe. You know, that her baby died, she buried it. Because that's clearly a death and a suicide. And she laid down to die with her, wrapped its arm around her arm, cut her throat to poison, whatever. She laid down there to die with this child that had died, or this being that had died, whatever it was. That's what we originally thought. Now we know, because of genetic testing, she was not its mother. They're not genetically related. They were husband and wife, they were a caretaker and a child, they were lovers, we don't know what. She had enough commitment to it to bury it when it died, 
killer set taking her own life to, to be there with her. So anyway, so she was in her 30s. Her teeth are flattened down like horse teeth. You can see the cusps all worn away, but that's eating a very gritty diet of corn and grit. So 30s is a good age probably for this, we're not as sure. Everything here is much smaller. You see the condyles, how much smaller relative to these. You see the mandibular fossa um, right here again, <coughs> as opposed to the size of that one. So you're just looking at a much reduced lower face here. But this indicates <coughs> a death, age of death of less than 25, if indeed it age the way we do. Next slide. This is an x-ray of the two, and you see the human eye sockets and the frontal sinuses of a normal, no, no, the frontal sinuses normal of human, it look like cauliflower, and you see where the star child completely missing, no frontal, not even vestigial, not even nubs, nothing, this thing didn't have sinuses at all. That's very unusual. And notice, if you will, look at how the normal eye sockets look. Look at these kind of, this, this flare thing going here, isn't that weird? We don't know what it means, but that's how it came out in the x-ray. Also notice, if you will, how the brain kind of looks like this fills up solid. And you have here a kind of a brain within a brain. We don't know what that means either. It's different. Next slide. OK, here we, we have some real strong proof against hydrocephaly from the outside. You see the veins. The brain presses up into the bone. And because the bone is soft, and this is from when you're a baby, bone is soft, the veins make dents in your bone. The bone kind of wraps around the veins, and you see the tracks going all the way up. Here you see the same thing. You see the tracks going up all the way. So, But then you see this, this bulge in the parietal that we don't have. <coughs> it's the same area here. So much more parietal. This was the area, by the way, that was a little extended in Einstein to make images. Look a little bigger than average. So makes you wonder. Next slide. The teeth. Okay, we have the little piece of maxilla, upper right maxilla. This is this piece of bone right here from the middle of your upper jaw around to the right. Okay, this is the size, forget how it looks here, it's real small and it's basically the size of a child. This is the nose opening, this is the opening for, so it had, a, it had a breathing capacity like we have. Nose opening like these are the two teeth over there. This tooth has been lost to DNA testing, unsuccessfully, unfortunately, the first time around. We still have this one. If you look in these holes here, you can see other teeth come waiting to come out. And you x-ray this and you see four teeth up in here. So it's pretty clear that it has a child's dentition, and that's why we call it the star child initially. So we were told, well, it's got you know, teeth down, teeth up, it's small, it's weird, it's a child. So we call it the star child for a very long time before we began to really wonder if the wormy and bone issue might indicate that it was older than the child. We still don't know. Next slide. We take a close up at the remaining tooth. What you see is a lot of a lot of wear on the enamel, shearing across the enamel up to that point right there. You see pitting with the pit here, pit here, pits, and you see this crack here. This is called crazy. This is like an adult tooth wear seen in what seems to be about a four and a half, five year old child. Hard to figure. We still, again, we still don't have answers here. Next slide. Now, when now it gets interesting. So we cut some bone to do some DNA testing. Karina was there. When it was cut, two things happened. The geneticists who had dealt with it, cutting bone for quite some time and knew a lot about it, said, ooh, boy, this is with the Dremel blades, boy, this is tough to cut. This is much tougher than it should be for such thin bone. <coughs> such thin like bone, you'd think it just cracked through like an shell. It didn't. It was resistant to the Dremel blade. The Dremel blade being a circular blade and <coughs> curls on a little thing like a kind of like a flashlight like that. Okay, so and not only that, it produced a, a profound, profound smell of burning tooth. You know when you get your teeth drilled, that, that smell everybody recognizes, it's not enamel, it's collagen. That is collagen. I didn't know that until fairly recently. That smell is burning collagen, not enamel. 
Bone is made of two things, hydroxy, calcium hydroxyapatite or apatite and collagen. Mammal is distinctive for two, so that is burning collagen that you smell. Strong smell of collagen. So we were surprised by those two things, but the hardness issue was the one that got them. They said, you ought to have this tested. Now, the DNA proved, first time through, they took the bone like this, a piece like this, and they put it in the normal dissolving fluid, which is called EDTA. And EDTA is just a dissolvent that you take normal bone and it'll dissolve it away in about a week. And then they go to work on taking away everything except the DNA and do the DNA testing in about a week. And they said, well, it's so thin and so different, so light, you know, it's probably going to be maybe three days, maybe four days, and EDTA will dissolve it and it'll start. Ten weeks later, it looked the same. Ten weeks later, it looked the same and not dissolved at all. So they said, we're going to put a, a, a detergent in it called Tween 20, and that's pretty strong, and that should take it down. It should take at least some of it down so we can work with it. They put the Tween 20 in it, poof, gone, overnight, gone, gone, gone. Completely dissolved overnight. That was a surprise, too. But they used what the liquid that was left, and they, they tested it. And now the mother, her mitochondrial DNA and her nuclear DNA came up really as beautiful, no problem. The assumption being that in 900 years, being in a mine tunnel, not being rained on, not being dried out, not being bleached by the sun, all that, it should be. The DNA should be well preserved, and it was in the human. Star child, the only difference being it was buried, its mitochondrial DNA, its mother, the part that comes from its mother, came up beautifully, no problem. The nuclear DNA, which is the, from the inside of the nucleus, you know, in a cell, the mitochondrial DNA floats outside the cell, and it's like little chips of stone, and it's very durable. The nuclear DNA is the chromosome package inside the nucleus, and it's fairly fragile. It didn't, for whatever reason, come up. They tried it four times. Each time the, new, the mitochondrial DNA came up easy, the nuclear DNA did not. Couldn't figure it out. They said, well, there must have been some kind of weird degradation going on. It's understandable, it was buried, it might have been very acidic soil, it was buried in, got some staining, so we kind of excused it away. We just said, we're going to have to wait a while until the primers get more sophisticated to get the nuclear DNA, but we believe nuclear DNA is here because the mitochondrial DNA is it, so easy to Okay, so they said in the meanwhile you should test the bone for to see about the chemistry to see why it's so hard to cut because that's unusual. Not worried too much about the smell. The smell is a secondary <coughs> to why it was so hard to cut. So finally, this the the lady who had put up the money for the DNA testing, she had taken a partner named Grant Singleton, who's now a partner in the deal, and. He now runs Cognosis, and he arranged to have the bone tested with the scanning electron microscope at the Royal Holloway Scientific Institute in London, which is a castle, really a castle that's been converted into a scientific institute. So in the scanning electron microscope, this is what we saw. This is the cortical bone layer, outer, it's like a sandwich. Bone is like a sandwich, if, if this type cortical layer outside and underneath and the inside are the cancellous holes. And in here is where the marrow goes. The marrow moves. The bone has, it doesn't have vessels and things like that. It has, it has these holes and, and the marrow just kind of oozes through the cancellous holes. So when they looked at the scanning electron microscope and took the pictures and they saw this, they said, holy smokes, what is this? These things here, see these? These are not known in bone, regular bone. Never seen before. Don't know what they are. Next slide. We're going to look at a couple of them up close, but these are just samples of others that you can, that were in many of the cancellous holes of the star child. Very strange. Next slide. We're going to look at that one first. We call it the knot. Now, this looks like a little thin piece here that got wrapped up somehow in this, came out here, and all this is wrapped around it. We first saw this, we thought, well, it must be some kind of capillary of some kind. But there are no capillaries in the bottom. There's 
not the way bone is set up. What is it? Next slide. This doesn't look the same. This is more like threads or hairs. What is it? No idea. Next slide. This was a piece of uh, just another area of the same piece of bone, which, by the way, is as big as my thumbnail or your thumbnail. Not, not a big piece of bone at all. Cut out of the starch out of it up here. Use your thumbnail. The blade was cutting loose fast, and as it came to the end of the cut, it let up on it a little bit. The speed is so we got a rougher cut here. Now, just we're going to focus on this <coughs> area right here. Next slide. See what you get? Look at these thready like things starting to appear. Next slide. We're getting closer. Next slide. See it? Here, up to here, up to here, the shredded. Now, these chips of stuff are just the bone residue thrown out by the cutting process. You saw it all in the case of this whole Look at this little knobby thing here. Next slide. Move up to there. Here it is up here. You see this going up and you see it heading up. And this, whatever it is, is a different kind of thing. And this is a piece of it. But it's shredded, folks. Understand. It resisted the dremel blade, whatever it is, stronger than the bone. <coughs> That's what's amazing about it. Next slide. Now, you see this going up. This is the up thing here, it goes in and disappears into here. And there's another piece growing here that's different. And it looks like it fans out here. So when we saw this, the experts that were with us said, you know, this looks like it might be fungi or bacteria or something that's grown on the bone since you cut it. Why don't you have it tested by my ecologist or at least looked at by my ecologist and see what they say, my ecologist being specialist in fungi and bacteria. We took it to three in England, including the very best England has. That's my college. He said, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen this in bone. I have no idea what it is. But there are 30,000 possible examples of fungi or bacteria. Maybe I don't know them all. And you need to have it tested to find out what it is for sure, which we agree with. We do need to have it tested. We have a test called long talk that will tell us this. Fairly sophisticated, fairly expensive, but it can nail us down. But he says, I don't think this is bacteria or fungi. It looks like something, something built into the bone. Next slide. Now, what also is weird about it is it, these things are high in silicon. They have about 25% silicon in whatever they are, which is unusual. You see here in the base of it, going on up. I don't know what it is. Next slide. Now, here's another one. It's not out of a cancellous hole. It probably came from a cancellous hole, but it got sheared loose and it ended up here. Could have come from here? We don't know. But this is another one. No idea what it is. Next slide. We're going to look at this piece here. Next slide. See how it is? Kind of like praying mantis. And notice here it shredded off. It, it didn't cut, it tears. So our thought was, well, maybe this is part of what's making it so difficult to cut. Maybe it's some kind of fiber network that's laid through the bone that keeps it resistant to cutting. We don't know. These are things we have to find out. This is all fairly new. This is about, these are about four months old, and what you're going to see later are about six weeks old. This is all new stuff, hot cotton. You're some of the first people to see this. Okay. What we did after the first scanning electron microscope, though that was matter, it's a little more than half, and it just doesn't fit the same frame. Next slide. Now, this is the inside surface of the human female skull. Notice that this is a, an incrustation made up of silicon, sand and dust and grit, that is just collected to about a sixteenth of an inch layer on the inside of the skull. This is normal for 900 years in a high desert environment. This is the end, outside of the human fe female skull, the shyness again due to the shellac that was put on. <coughs> and see these dimples. This is dimpling on the surface of the skull. Again, perfectly normal. This is what you would expect. Excellent. Those dimples would be under the incrustation. You can see it. Now, this is the inside surface of the star child. And you do see the dimples. They're very shallow, but you do see them. And what do you notice? No incrustation. Though it was buried for the same 900 years, you would expect one of you see, but for some reason you don't see. 
This is the outer surface of the star child. You see no dimples at all. No dimples at all. Very strange. Next slide. Here you see a comparison of the two. See the human female inside with the encrustation that one would expect. Let me see here. Next slide. You see the outer surface of the human with the dimpling that is normal. And you see the outer surface of the star child with no dimples. Anybody can see that there is a significant difference between these two. And it should be, you know, it doesn't matter how deformed you are, if you're human, the bone ought to be human. You think whatever's left should be human. Okay, now, what after that was done, a guy that we contacted who's a specialist in this said, we're going to now take the bone and instead of cut it, we're going to take the cut piece and we're going to snap it. We're going to break it, both the human and the star child, and get what are called fractured edges. And then we're going to take them and polish them down with lapidary tools, with the jeweler tools. We're going to very slowly and very carefully take it down, flatten it out, and make sure that no crud gets in the cancellous holes because they were looking to see what causes toughness and because it looked like some of the layers of the cortical bone seemed to have a, 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 chemi a chemical reading of enamel. And so the thought was, well, maybe we can find some sign in the star child bone of, of enamel rather than of layering rather than what humans have, which is sort of like poor concrete. So this is the human polished, one side, the outside, the upper, the outside of the head there. And you see polished how clean the bone is. Do you know why? When you die, when you die, you carry within your body the bacteria that are going to consume you down to nothing over time. Mother Nature cleans her plate. If she didn't, we'd walk out of here and there'd be thousand foot high piles of bones out there. Mother Nature cleans her plate. How does she do it? She puts in you when you're born the bacteria that are going to eat you up. And there are bacteria in you that eat your marrow out. And that's why normal cancellous bone looks like this, like it's been licked clean, because it has. And also, normal human bone looks like alabaster. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's polished and shined up like this. Beautiful. This is how it looks. Next slide. This is just the other side. And this is the inner layer, and that is the layer of incrustation that you saw flat on a while ago. And you see a little bit of like layering here, but you see it's very irregular and, and it goes down kind of like in sheets, kind of like again, poured concrete. But again, you see how clear the cancellous holes are. Human. Next slide. And you see the star child, and you see difference. It's kind of milky. It's got thicker band in here. And that's what red now like enamel. So that could have something. But you see the cancellous holes, that milkiness, you know what the milkiness is from? Guess what? Collagen we found out. Collagen. Remember I told you that that smell, the first cut, was so stinky bad of the bone? Collagen. Guess what? This piece of bone, one half as thick that it should be, carries the full load, the full load of, of collagen. Like a compressed computer file. We don't know how that much collagen, or why, for that matter, that much collagen is there. But it's clear to see that it is. There's no shine, there's no alabaster, it's it's creamy milky. That's caused by the added collagen, which we don't understand. But most importantly, do you notice anything at all kind of weird about this? Look dead center. Dead in the center. You see? You see this little speck here? What does that look to your eyes? See any reddish there? Yeah. Next slide. We missed it the first time through, but we didn't miss this. Look at this. How did the bacteria not eat that away? Next slide. Close up. Close up on this. This. What do you think that is? That could be one of two things. <coughs> desiccated marrow, which is the most likely thing, or some kind of inorganic mineral that got left 
behind somehow that the bacteria couldn't could eat and couldn't dissolve. Except no such thing is known. No such thing is known to be in the bone marrow. So either way you cut it, this is extremely weird. Extremely unacceptable. <coughs> extremely potentially historic. Because if this is desiccated marrow, guess what? That's organic. Guess what else? The geneticists had it, had it in hand and couldn't find nuclear DNA with human primers. And what does that tell you? It's not human DNA. That's why they were getting the mitochondrial DNA, but not getting the nuclear DNA. Because the primers were, were going after human nuclear DNA and they weren't matching up. Now, if it's inorganic, which it could be, if it's inorganic, we still have to find out what it's doing there. What is it made of? What's it doing there? Folks, this is very potentially a historic thing you're looking at here. Because even if it's not alien connected, it's the weirdest human thing that anybody's ever seen, more so than the elephant man. This is a big deal just beginning to bubble up to the surface of consciousness around the world. You're in at the cutting edge. Next slide. Here we see a back lip, and this was flipped, the, the bone itself was flipped. Girl who did the slide setting just made a mistake. This is the top, uh, the, yes. the top side of the side, flipped wrong. But anyhow, the point is, there you go. Look at how much there is. Next slide, when you back like it. Next slide, close up. It's just astonishing. I mean, everybody that we've had eight major big time scientists in England from the Royal Holloway look at this, including mycologists, and they all say, gee whiz, we have no idea what this is. But you have to find out next time. These are the tests that we need, just some of the tests, most of the major tests. We need a third DNA analysis, which is now underway, seeking the nuclear DNA. We assume we're going to get enough money to pay for it. We haven't yet, but we're open to the test. We need a detailed dental analysis of the enamel surface of the kitchen. Molotov test to, as I said earlier, test for the bacteria and the fungi. A detailed analysis of the fibers in the residue, the fibers in the redstone. What are they? What are they made of? We need to know that. Microtomography, 3D data on the internal structure, what's making it so hard? Inductively coupled plasma spectrometry and laser radio spectroscopy for trace elements. Are there trace elements in here that don't belong? Are there trace elements of things we don't have normally on Earth, or things we've never heard of, or combinations that shouldn't be? Test all that. Light element stable isotope analysis, strontium lead isotope ratios. The isotope ratios analysis, what they tell you is where the thing lived, what its environment was like, what it, made, what it left behind, <coughs> its bone. What, what its environment was like. It's amazing what they can do with these things. They're, they're very sophisticated and they're very expensive, but before they could, they're just amazing. X-ray power, power, diffraction, crystal, biomimal, uh, to tell us about that. More scanning electron microscope examinations on multiple fracture surfaces. Both to see more of the fibers, to see more of the red stuff and try to see what it is. Transmitted light mice, microscopy, structural features again looking for hardness electron probe and or ion probe inclusions just stuff they, they want to know I don't even understand most of it analyzing crustaceans inside those skulls and visit the recovery area in Mexico and take soil samples to make sure that matches up to make sure that the soil and crustacean came from where the skull supposedly came we assume that they did and we just but we absolutely have to prove it a clay model reconstruction, facial features, that's something we just kind of like. We, we, we can use that, but we're going to use whatever money we get to do the testing first because that's more important. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it very much. I won't keep you any longer with this. You can clap now if you want to.